But as for me and my house, he took a stand. Joshua took a stand, and those that were under his authority, perhaps, those that were in his house, certainly a great lesson there. And, and, and that personal choice um, that we see at the end, chapter 24. Excellent. Anything else? Salvation. Salvation. Salvation how? If we were to narrow that down. Quit sinning. Quit sinning. Yeah, so the, ultimately what you find unfold in Joshua is that sin is condemned and punished while obedience is rewarded. We would see that, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Or are you just waving? Because I haven't said good morning to you yet. Good morning. Moses' successor, yes. Yeah. So some historical aspects. I have that here written down. Um, Deuteronomy 34, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Joshua is um, given the instruction, given the authority passed on by Moses to him to lead the, God's people into the promised land. And so, yes, very good. Along those lines, um, I wrote down kind of the timeline. It doesn't matter necessarily to us. It's not extremely relevant, and I say that carefully. Around 1400 B.C., our timeline, the biblical timeline, is certainly important in our overall understanding of the Scripture. Um, it helps us in our studies. But historically, this book of Joshua written in about a 50-year period. Um, and so... The successor to Moses, we can date that or go back to Deuteronomy 34. And then this 50 years of conquest throughout the land of Canaan. So excellent there and some history um, that we see in the book of Joshua. Anything else? Those are all great points. He knew who was in control. He knew he was in control. So a concept that we see that Joshua knew that he was um, God's chosen man to do certain things but nothing on his own volition, that it was God guiding him. And Moses passed that along to Joshua because Moses knew the same thing. And then when, Joshua, or excuse me, when Moses tried to do it his way, it, things went wrong, right? And thus, Moses didn't get to enter into the promised land because at one point he thought, well, I'm going to do this my way instead of God's. So absolutely. The conquests, if you look through the book of Joshua, um, again, uh, lots of history there of God's people and the conquest through the land of Canaan. Um, God's promises fulfilled. We're going to look at one of those specifically this morning. But God's promises, he promised Joshua certain things the same way he promised Moses, the same way he promised Jacob and, and Abraham and all of God's promises fulfilled. And for us, there is hope in that. I think that's a wonderful lesson. And I'm sure I feel confident that um, as you study the book of Joshua, or perhaps you already have, that that is a point that, uh, that the Bible class teacher would be making. God's promises are fulfilled, and we see that in Joshua. Prepared and proven. He was prepared to take on that leadership role. He was proven in Exodus 17 to take on that role. And then I wrote down um, some events, the events there that we're often um, familiar with or talk about in the book of Joshua, certainly Joshua chapter 6, the walls of Jericho. And we're familiar with that account, familiar with that story. Joshua chapter 7, the sin of Achan, the battle against Ai, the land divisions there that are made um, and, and set forth in the book of Joshua. And then Brother Steve mentioned, Brother Wiseman mentioned, um, Joshua's farewell address, chapter 23 and chapter 24, um, something that we spend lots of time on, and rightly so, uh, but very, very important. This morning, I want to spend a to the majority of our time on two topics, however. Two topics that we find in the bush book of Joshua and kind of unfold these biblical concepts. Something that you can add to your, uh, I put down, spiritual tool belt. And perhaps you haven't seen them, perhaps you haven't heard them uh, taught from the book of Joshua. But I, I believe they are certainly worthy of consideration. And um, when it comes to what we'll talk about in the sermon hour, the gospel message this morning, is they pertain to us defending our faith. 1 Peter 3.15, always giving an answer, being ready to give an answer. And as we walk through our and journey through our lives here, and we, we perhaps encounter false teachings or false doctrines, I want to look at a couple of those this morning because there's two that I believe Joshua gives us great examples on how we can defend against those and uh, defend our faith. So, so firstly, this morning, 
We're in Joshua. Hopefully everyone's turned there. We're not going to spend a ton of time on, on defining this, but just a show of hands, if I were to say the term premillennialism, are we familiar with, with what that is? Okay, so, so ultimately this premillennial doctrine that is, it is certainly popular today, um, ultimately the fact that Jesus is going to come back to this earth and reign for a thousand years. Is that me popping, I guess? Okay, okay. I, wanted to, I didn't think I was doing too much, but I uh, want to make sure. But this thousand-year reign, that Jesus would come back in the second coming of Christ, that he would come back to this earth, set up an earthly kingdom, and reign for a thousand years, and specifically in Israel, Jerusalem, that we would, he would restore this holy land. And brethren, let me make it very clear this morning, the Bible teaches nothing of the sort. And what we see in Joshua is, again, we'll look at God's fulfillment of the land promise to his people. And this is not the only place, but it is one of the places that we can go to the scripture, God's holy word, and refute premillennialism and just like that. And so when the premillennialist and that doctrine are focusing on spiritual, excuse me, on earthly kingdoms, on earthly things, Ronald Reagan, beginning in his presidency, started subsidizing Israel a lot based on his religious beliefs. And even since that time, others in leadership in the United States have spent billions of our American dollars, and this is not a political speech, but we are upholding the land of Israel, mostly based on false religious beliefs, incorrect and accurate religious beliefs, that that is the Holy Land. And that that is where Christ is coming to set up his earthly kingdom once more and reign for a thousand years. And brethren, in John 18, 36, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And we need to understand that. We need to be able to defend against that. So the premillennial doctrine, go with me if you would. You're hopefully in Joshua. Hold your place there and go back to Genesis. Let's look at this land promise. Genesis chapter 12. This morning we are trying to defend against and um, uphold our conviction um, of Christ. God has fulfilled this land promise to his people and refute the premillennial doctrine. Genesis chapter 12, go with me to verse number 6, if you will. Genesis 12 and verse 6. And we kind of find the beginning of that land promise here. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. In verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed I will give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So we first see Jesus, excuse me, God, verse number 7, promising Abram, whose name would be changed to Abraham um, later on, I will give you this land. This la give you thy seed there give you this land. And then so go over to chapter 13, just a page or so over. And let's look at that again. If God says it once in the scripture, it's important. If it's said multiple times, we better be paying attention. And that's, that is basic uh, logic, I believe. If your parents tell you to pick up the toys once, well, once is enough. If they tell you a few times, you better be hot stepping to pick up the toys, pick, clean up your room, whatever it may be. We pay a little bit more attention. And so here God again, chapter 13, gives us this promise again, gives this promise to Abraham. Chapter 13, verse number 15. Well, let's start in 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed forever. So now we have two. So Genesis 12, 6, Genesis 13, 15, but then it really hits home in Genesis 15. So turn over a couple pages. Genesis 15. And we could begin reading in verse number 7, 
Uh, for time's sake, I want us to go uh, to verse 18. But just recall, keep down in your notes, store it in your memory. Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 15. The, seed, the land promised to Abraham and his seed. Verse 18 of Genesis 15. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. And then look at the specifics here. The exact parameters and geography of this land that was promised. Unto thy seed I have given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenzedites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Raphams and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gerashites and the Jebusites. He gives him this land. All of it here from where Abram's standing, where Abraham is standing, and he gives them this land and he mentions the people, so he's more specific here in Genesis 15. And so then when we take that and we turn back over to Joshua, so we've got Genesis 12, 13, 15, and then get to Joshua. Let's go to Joshua chapter 1. They have now passed across the Jordan. Here is this uh, promise renewed, if you will. Verse 11, Joshua 1, verse 11. Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, saying, for within, Prepare you victuals, for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess. Reiterate it again. He's giving you the land. All right, so then verse, and then let's go to chapter 2, verse 24. So Joshua 1, 11. Then chapter 2, verse 24. And they said unto Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. So we're starting to put the pieces together. The commandments of God. He is promised and he is carrying out that promise through his people. We're going to look secondly in class this morning of, of the obedience that was mentioned earlier of um, faith and works in, in joined together. And we'll, we'll look at that. Yes, ma'am. And don't faint. The inhabitants of the country do faint. Anybody else have a different translation? This is the King James. Melted. What's that? Melted. Melted away. Whenever God sends his people in, under his guidance, his power, being fully obedient to him, brethren, it held true in the book of Joshua and it holds true in 2022. Nobody stands a chance. With God, they were given that land and anyone that stood up against them would faint, fall away, melt away, um, obviously what we see um, literally in the book of Joshua is physical battles, you know, war, and, and no one could stand against God's army. The Lord of hosts, go uh, do some research on the, the term the Lord of hosts in the scripture, and you find out that that is a, um, a, almost a military term. Um, and so when God's people would go in, these people literally, they could wipe them out in the sense of battle. Yes, sir. The footnote of mine says, Demoralized, okay. Where they just have no will to fight anymore. Sure. Okay, there you go. Um, so hopefully that answers that, that question there. Um, so 224, again, let, let's back up and we've got Genesis, the land, pro, the land promise, 12, 13, and 15 chapters of Genesis, Gen, uh, Joshua 1, Joshua 2, and then let's go and, and let's kind of put a bow on it in, in Joshua chapter 21. This is what I have had highlighted in my Bible for years. This is what I was taught. Uh, but I think we needed to go back to see that land promise. If we're not familiar with it, um, in, the, in what was promised to Abraham, what was promised to his seed, to God's people. But then here in Joshua 21, Joshua 21, I believe it's pretty plain and simple here. This refutes premillennialist doctrine. Joshua 21, verse number 43. And the Lord gave unto Israel 
all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. The promised land is called the promised land, brethren, because God promised it in Genesis. And then Joshua 21, 43. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Joshua 21, verse 43. Absolutely. If I get going too fast or get too worked up, um, please. Absolutely. We want to get this right. We, we, we can take all day. There is no time clock um, as far as I'm concerned. Brother Steve may say otherwise. Brother Clint, we don't have to worry about him. He's not here. But, uh, but, but we want to get this right. So Joshua 21, 43. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. The land was promised, and here it is fulfilled. Yeah, well, that's only one verse again, Dane. Okay, well, let's look at another one. Joshua 23. Go to Joshua 23 with me a couple pages over. In verse number 14, Joshua 23, verse number 14. And here is the beginning of Joshua's farewell address, his farewell speech. And behold, this day I am going all the way, going the way of all the earth. And ye know in all your hearts and all your souls that God hath not failed of all the good things. Excuse me. And ye know in your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you and not one thing has failed thereof. If God promised it in Genesis, it's fulfilled here in Joshua. The land promise that God gave the promised land in Genesis 12, 13, and 15, we find it here fulfilled in Joshua and the confirmation of that. They went into Canaan by God's power and with his authority, took the promised land. They took the enemy. They dwelt and possessed the land of Canaan. And so we see that those two verses together are confirmation. It, either the Bible is right or it's not. If you look at 2143, I, it can't be any clearer to me. And by faith, I believe that if it says the Lord gave Israel all the land that he sware to give unto their fathers and they possessed it and lived there, or dwelt there, did they or didn't they? That reads that it, it, they did. And so to me, it's very plain and simple. And if you want to talk premillennial, doc, premillennial doctrine, well, we can talk about it. But is the Bible right or is it not? Yes, ma'am. I think we had a couple comments. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and, and I know that Brother Clint has some material on that as well. Um, it, it is a, the basic doctrine there, but I have notes that I can give you. But ab absolutely. And uh, uh, there is some resources that, that I know that we, could, that we could get. It is something that we need to be uh, mindful of. It is ever growing. And, and absolutely. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Do you have something? So yeah, either it's like seemingly plain and simple. The Bible is right or it's not. One other place that we see it. Turn over if you were in Joshua 23. Go to Joshua 24. And look at verse 13. And here's Joshua again. It was Joshua speaking in chapter 23. And here he is continuing to address the people in chapter 24. And look at verse 13. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, which you did not, excuse me, and I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you built not, and you dwell in them. Of the vineyards and olive yards which you planted not, do you eat. And then he gives therefore in verse 14. Now therefore, God promised it, God fulfilled it. And he says, now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in Sincerity and truth. This morning we aim to worship our God in spirit 
and in truth, John 4 and 24. That sounds very familiar. And if you do take notes in your Bible or you want to make an Old Testament and a New Testament connection, Joshua said, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Joshua 24, 14 and John 4 and 24. Jesus himself says, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And that word sincerity and that word spirit seemingly interchangeable there. Um, so the land promise fulfilled, premillennial doctrine thrown out the window. I have one more, and then we'll move on. Nehemiah chapter 9. If, if we haven't proven the doctrine of premillennial, and again, this is a long, drawn-out thing that we could study for, um, for several weeks. Uh, but in a short time in Bible class, we can look and see exactly what the Bible says that God's land promise has been fulfilled. And if you don't believe those things, uh, let's look at Nehemiah chapter 9. Because this is post-captivity now. Now the, God's people have been put in captivity. Now they are returning to the promised land. And let's take a look in Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 7 through 9. And I want you to make note that this sounds exactly like the geography given in Genesis 15. So make connection here. Nehemiah 9, verses 7 through 9, gives the same parameters as Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. Let's read Nehemiah 9, verse 7 through 9. Thou art the Lord the God, who dost choose Abram, and brought us him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, and gave us him the name of Abraham, and found us his heart faithful before thee, and made us the covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanites. And notice the people that he mentions. The land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Gerashites, to give it, I say, to his seed, and has performed thy words, for thou art righteous. Post-captivity, God's people have gone through some things. They've been enslaved. They've been struggling. But God, by this man, tells them again, I promised you the land, and I gave you the land. And then when you compare the two in Nehemiah 9 and Genesis 15, it's the same land. Hundreds of years later. And that land is promised, and anyone that says otherwise, that God did not fulfill the promise made to Abraham as far as the land, um, I challenge them to read what the Bible says. And take it for what it says. And again, it seems pretty plain and simple. Uh, is the Bible right? Or do we want to kick against the goads? Because we've just in a very short time gone to a couple places. Seemingly, it's black and white to me. Any thoughts, any questions, comments on that? So in the framework for you, the people believe that the land promise has not been. That is correct. The premillennial doctrine says that the land promise in Genesis 12, 13, 15 to Abraham has not been fulfilled. And thus Jesus is coming back and they're, we're talking geography now to Israel to set up that kingdom and thus that will be the fulfillment of the land promise. Um, rather than it being fulfilled in this day and time, um, they, and, and that's why they cling to uh, the holy land. Uh, brethren, no, again, no, no, no land today is holy. There, there is no place that is holier than another. Um, God is holy. We come before him trying our very best to live and be holy. Um, but whether you're in this latitude or longitude or in that place or this place, brethren, that is a confused mind. Being holy is a characteristic of God. And according to what Peter would write in his first epistle, verse number 16, we need to be holy. For God is holy. And so... Um, you oftentimes use the, hear that term used, the Holy Land, and it is talking about Israel um, and that literally, that geography that was given in Genesis 15 and then here in Nehemiah 9 as this area that is coming back and it's a special place. Yes, ma'am. I never understood until now. So I don't know if we are 
teaching it young enough. Sure. Um, well, a- amen. I'm thankful for that. And in and, 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 and that same note, um, brethren, let that be an example that it's never, you're never too old or too young to learn what the Bible says. And so that is nothing against anyone in particular. And certainly don't um, count yourself as uh, lacking or guilty that you didn't know that. Um, Brethren, we always need to be studying to show ourselves approved, to get better. Um, And that's what Bible study is all about. And so um, amen to that. I'm thankful for it. Uh, But perhaps as gospel preachers and Bible class teachers, um, we we need to take note of such things and make sure that we're teaching the whole counsel of God um, and particularly those things that might be real as we go out into the world today. Of You see it on the news. Uh, you hear friends talk about it uh, in conversation at the coffee shop. Well, yeah, we're going to the Holy Land. Well, what, what's that about? And don't be afraid to ask those questions. The younger, the young people need to know that because there Absolutely. may be young people out there that say that. And yes, ma'am. Know how to defend That's why I wanted to bring it up in Bible class this morning. What scripture do they use to defend that? The... The, that it has not been fulfilled. A lot of it is in the New Testament. Part of it would be the new heaven and earth found in 1 Peter 5. You see a little bit about that. Um, I don't know the premillennial doctrine um, backwards and forwards. Uh, and so I, I know there's a number of scriptures, but right off the top of my head, I would have to do some of my research. But 1 Peter 5 and the idea of setting up the new heaven and new earth um, is, is part of that for sure. Revelation, yes. Yep. Same thing. That's correct. Absolutely. No, I mean, I would say I would certainly say the scripture bears out. There was a time and a place where God dwelt, and there was a temple in which God dwelt, and there was the holy place, and then the holy of holies, and, and there was certain rules that that was where God was, but in the Christian dispensation. Where we are now, brethren, um, we can't say that this place is, is better than this place or that there is no, as we call it, the Holy Land. That is an incorrect use of, of words. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We just, I mean, what did we just discuss in Joshua chapter 5 when um, Lord of Hosts says to Joshua, move the candle. <coughs> sure. You bet. I was going to use that one a second. Where you're standing is holy ground. I mean, wherever God was, you know, it's like the holy of holies. The place that God was on earth is is what is holy. Outside of that, that's right. Nothing here really ever even was considered holy. God was not there in dwelling. Well. That's right. And now He dwells in the church, the New Jerusalem, which is those of us who have been baptized into Christ, the symbol of here in other places. Sure. The 20s, where He dwells in us through the Spirit. And that's what makes us considered a holy people. That's correct. Sure, and, and we've got to be very careful today. I think we often get, and certainly in the time of COVID, we talked about, well, um, gathering together in the church building. Um, this building, there's nothing special about this building, brethren. Well, I'm not going to go in the, well, you lied in the church building. You better you know, get right. It, don't lie. it doesn't matter if you lie in the church building or out of the church building. Quit lying. <laughs> be holy. Um, and so, yes, sir, Brother Sammy, that is... We get that confused, and uh, there are places that, and again, I'll kind of say this a, a little bit um, loose. There are certainly places of reverence. We come in here, brethren, and we are reverent, but it has nothing to do with, with the building at all. It has to do with what we're here for and our motives and our purpose, and that is part of being holy. And, and you know, we act certain ways when we go to a nice restaurants, perhaps, or a funeral, and it, but holy land is something that we need to um, take out of our vernacular and, and, and be able to withstand if, if somebody brings that up and, and at least have a discussion about that. Yes, sir? Uh, Absolutely. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 24, talks about that new Jerusalem. Um, the, 
heavenly Zion or heavenly Jerusalem, uh, the mountain of Zion, which today, again, Seth mentioned, it, this, it is the church, the spiritual Jerusalem today. This is what is what God would deem holy, us, the church, his people. And uh, we better do everything we can to live that way um, and uphold that name, that new name that's given to us, Christians. Not anything else, but Christians, and we need to be do our best. Um, time's escaping us. Any, anything else? Those are good discussions. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and uh, so I'm new, and I'm learning the Bible really for the first time. Yes, ma'am. At uh, this, at my age, and um, all right. You know, obviously, so. Amen. I appreciate it when someone does take the time to just stop and go. Okay, in layman's terms. Sure. You know, and, and really it helps. Absolutely, amen. And and and, and brethren, again, let me make make the point. Understanding and studying the Bible is a labor of a lifetime. I have a good brother that preaches in Tennessee that he says, I was Baptist born and Baptist bred. I thank God I'm not Baptist dead. <laughs> Don't, that guilt or that thought that you may have, brethren, it takes us and it should take us a lifetime of study to understand what God says and let us be diligent in doing so in Bible, our personal Bible study, our collective Bible classes. And brethren, we don't look down upon anyone, whether you are a current Baptist or whether you are part of a denomination somewhere. Brethren, we just want to get the Bible right. And we want to do what God says in absolute obedience. And so that's what we strive to do um, no matter what the age is. And, uh, and let, us, let us strive ever so much to do so daily. They are opening the doors. And, uh, yes, ma'am. Jews, they, people today say that Jews are God's people. I mean, is that part of the free will? Absolutely, part of it. Yes, ma'am. Um, and, and, again, go back to starting in Genesis, and we talk about being called God's people. Um, we talk about this uh, race or nation. But we can go to several places, more than several places in the New Testament. And Brother Steve, make note in Bible class or what have you when, we get, when the time allows to go over some of that. Because um, absolutely Jesus Christ died for the Jews just as much as the Gentiles. And, and when, people are, when we see the book of Acts, um, chapter 10, um, and really we talk about Romans 1, 2, and 3. All are under sin, both Jew, Gentile, the whole world. Christ died for all, so many places. Um, giving us a new name, we just mentioned Revelation 3. What today God's chosen people are, God's children, um, the scripture continually bears out are those that hear, believe, obey his word, repent of their past sins, whatever they may have been, and become a new creature by means of water baptism. And those are the current day God's children, God's people. And again, we don't have a ton of time to, um, to flesh that out this morning. So we're time's up, right? I, I can go all day. Clay, yes, sir. Yes. There's a lot there, and, and, and again, perhaps a great um, future study, whether it's me coming back and we'll study it, um, or, or uh, Bible class here uh, going forward. So thank you for your time and your attention. We didn't get to get to part two. Uh, Lord willing, we'll get to do it another time, but uh, thank you so much.